Hello, and welcome to the Voluntary Virtues Network. My name is Michael, and I'll be your host on something as rotten in the state of Denmark. Today I'll be having Grosen Fries with me to talk a bit about uh, his journey to becoming a voluntarist, and a bit about the US economy as seen from over here in Europe. Well, welcome to you, Grosen. Oh, thanks. Thanks a lot. I'm uh, delighted to be here. I'm deli very delighted to have you. It's really exciting. And I've been saying to you for a while that I knew you'd become an anarchist sometime, but... Yeah, I guess you're right. Um, actually, <laughs> I don't uh, I don't call myself an anarchist, but, but that's because I always, uh, I always view that anarchist as, you know, bullies running in the streets, making trouble, uh, smashing windows, uh, burning <laughs> tires, etc. So I really like the word like libertarian, and then you can call yourself like I was before, a uh, libertarian uh, with a minarchist tag, and now I call myself a libertarian with a voluntarism tag on. Yeah, it's all the propaganda. It's nothing else. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just that. But it's it's still the same. Mm -hmm. So, who, who cares really? <laughs> <laughs> Not me anyway. But I was, I'd like to thank you for coming on tonight. It's going to be an exciting show, I hope. Yes, I hope so too. We have around 30 minutes and I think we should just get right on it. Yeah, okay. But um, tell me a bit about your journey to becoming a voluntarist. Oh, uh, it's it's actually a very long journey. I should try to make it as short as possible. Um, I have been, you know, voting all my life. I have been uh, really used uh, tons of time, uh, uh, you know, on politics. Um, I've always always been interested in politics. I've always been what I think uh, British or American listeners would call a um, a conservative. Um, and um, well, I started voting for a, a Danish party called uh, Venstre. You know, it's like a, it's like a, a light uh, a, um, a conservative party. I did that for many, many years. Then um, I found out that uh, during the last government uh, with uh, the prime minister called Anders Fogh Rasmussen, um, the government that was from approximately 2000 to 2011, um, that uh, during uh, this period, the uh, public sector in Denmark grew with approximately 40,000 people. That's and I thought they were a government that was conservative and fiscal responsible, etc. So I said, enough is enough. So, uh, and, and at that time, there was uh, a more, um, and even not more conservative necessarily, actually more, a more libertarian-like party. Um, uh, it, it was called uh, Liberal Alliance, and of course, liberal does not mean liberal like in the United States. It means classical liberalism alliance. Yeah, more like libertarian party. Yeah, exactly. But uh, of course, they still love uh, taxes. They still love uh, a lot of uh, the things that are part of, that are part of the welfare state. But uh, at that time, I, I was um, not thinking that much about taxation, VAT, and. Uh, tariffs and, and, and uh, how much um, uh, or how wrong actually it is to, to force people into all these uh, government programs and the way it's financed so uh, I just thought that well they were better at least they were that was the party that was most like um, like my um, my personal opinions so I uh, voted for them and I actually uh, and for, for both parties both at local elections and at uh, National elections, I've always helped uh, candidates, you know, setting up posters, um, writing uh, uh, articles, and and uh, during election time, at, l at the last elections, I helped a candidate for uh, this uh, Liberal Alliance uh, Party or Libertarian Alliance. Uh, I helped them make videos, etc., etc. And, um, and finally, uh, during this election, um, I... Um, I began to listen to um, to um, you know I started listening to Ron Paul I started listening to um, to Peter Schiff and I became more and more educated into uh, you know away from old-fashioned Keynesian economics into Austrian economics and suddenly everything about economics just clicked because I really think Austrian economics is spot on uh, regarding how uh, economics works so uh, and then I started to listen to uh, Stefan Molyneux and that was um, that was um, my uh, final moment, I think, I listened to this uh, show, you know, he, he's got one called uh, The Truth About Voting, 
And he's also got one about um, if uh, if you're interested in politics and, and tells about how that is. And I have listened to these shows like six, seven, eight times each. And every time I listened to them, I, I thought to myself, well, I think he's right. Uh, he's absolutely correct. And I began uh, realizing how much time I've wasted for years and years and years trying to work for um, more limited government, less welfare state, more personal freedom. And what happens? The public sector grows, national debt grows, personal liberties are um, you know, taken away one small bite at a time just so that we won't uh, protest. Um, so um, that made me realize that, well, I am actually not a... Uh, a uh, libertarian with a minarchist attack. I am actually a libertarian with a um, with a uh, with a voluntarist attack. Another thing, uh, and then I sh I think I've covered that uh, question. Um, you know, I said I realized a long time ago taxation is theft. But then I worked hard to uh, you know uh, um, uh, 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 telling people well uh, if if the government put on tax not taxes sorry on tariffs or value-added taxes. That's uh, an okay way to finance uh, the government. And that's just as much theft and coercion as taxes are. So I also realized that I could not continue being a, a libertarian with a minarchist tag because um, I would not be um, faithful to my uh, own logic. It's, that, that sounds like it has been quite the journey, actually. Mm -hmm. Yes, it sounds has. Sounds tough. Uh, it, yes, it is, and it's also tough to uh, to uh, sort of uh, slowly tell your surroundings that uh, um, well, I'm not voting anymore, I'm not uh, participating, and also slowly telling people that you uh, you f you actually think that voting is uh, um, trying to um, get uh, as many people on board um, concerning uh, your values, and after that you uh, mass bully them according to what you believe is the right thing, whereas uh, in, a f in a free society everybody um, are responsible for themselves, but um, and, and this means that they can live their lives just as they want to, not being bullied by anybody. And uh, if they want to change things or in, interact with other people, well, they can do it voluntarily. What uh, impact did uh, this journey have on you as a person? Um, I, uh, Emotionally speaking, of course, um, how did it touch you? Um, and hard? When I actually realized, and I, um, I wrote on my blog um, that uh, I can't remember the title, uh, but it's something like um, that now I realized that I was actually a voluntarist, and I wrote it, and I, this made me, you know, it uh, made me able to take all my thoughts and uh, and 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 put it down and systematically outline um, why am I changing? And after that, I've actually been uh, totally liberated. I no longer pay any attention to what politicians are writing on Facebook. I hardly ever watch any news on TV uh, that is mainstream news, uh, especially not with politicians. Uh, or anything regarding politics, or now they have to vote for this reform or that reform. Um, yeah, I, I just can't I, take that seriously when I see them. It's like they're living on another planet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, but it really, really liberated me, and I've now I've been able to spend so much more time doing really good things like taking care of my garden, taking care of my house, taking care of my family. Uh, I'm homeschooling my son, spending even more time preparing for that and doing that well, uh, working um, and, and earning um, some money for my family and focusing on those things. And, um, and, uh, and another thing I can too is that I can actually also, when I do a blog post or videos uh, of my own, well, then the, I'm focused on um, telling people about the ideas of liberty. I don't have to sort of uh, always uh, incorporate everything that has to do with statism. It's really uh, liberating. And it's much more easy to to argue for liberty when you don't have this, uh, this, um, this state involved all the time. Yeah, you mentioned uh, Molino. Uh, I know you're doing a lot of peaceful parenting ex mm -hmm. exercises. And, yeah. And you have an autistic son. Yeah, correct. And could you tell me a bit about the experience uh, with uh, having him around the public schools and having him home instead? 
Um, well, he has uh, two difficulties. Um, many autistic children, they have at least, uh, or they usually have at least one difficulty, and that's uh, a lack of uh, um, social skills. And then they may have a uh, one, two, or more extra. And sometimes they, it can be anything. It, it, it could also be that they have a um, a physical uh, disability. But my son, he uh, there's nothing wrong with him physically, but he has, of course, a low social skill, and he his um, his uh, talking skills are also uh, not uh, that good. So that that's the areas where we are focusing. And when he was uh, very little, uh, it was uh, discovered he was about four or five years old. And um, in the beginning, he was uh, sent to a uh, special kindergarten, but that uh, and that was okay. That was some kind of a monitoring kindergarten. It was a small group, and they were doing okay things. Uh, and the reason why we thought that was okay was because there were a ton of normal kids that he could mirror himself in. Then he was sent to a special kindergarten. That was absolutely awful. Uh, there were only other kids where um, you know they also had problems. They never. Uh, were together with normal kids, which I believe is essential for kids with um, with any uh, disabilities that they are as much as possible together with normal kids so they can mirror them. And another thing is that normal kids, they would actually, uh, you know, um, experience that that uh, having an, um, a not normal thing in their midst can actually be normal. I think it's very good for them too. Um, then we it didn't take long. We took him out and then we discovered uh, a, um, a, a methodology for teaching autistic children. It's called ABA. It's an abbreviation for Applied Behavior Analysis. And what that actually is, is just intensive training as much as you can. Um, and we've done that with him since he was approximately five. And it's also voluntarily. Uh, that said, uh, he, uh, we don't necessarily force him to do it. Uh, what we do is that uh, if he... If he does not want to participate, and this is when he was very young, uh, we just pulled out the, the chair and it was time out. So uh, what he could do, what he could either be extremely bored or he could work with us. And of course, it was up to us to make training and education and, and all the exercise we had to do it it would have to be as motivating as possible. And you're giving him a lot of incentives nowadays, aren't you? Uh, yes, uh, and, and um, but you know, at that time, I um, was not that much, uh, you know, aware of making the um, the training and his education as uh, voluntary and as uh, motivating as possible. But I, I, I would, of course, never, you know, take him in his arm and pull him in, pull him back into a chair or stuff like that. But I must admit that I have yelled at him, in, but that was in frustration that the training was not, uh, you know, working as fast as we we would like. But um, of course, um, oh, stuff like that I have regretted, but you can't change the, the past. But what I always do, um, and I've always done that, and my wife too, if we, you know, do him some kind of wrong, like in frustration, yell at him or sing, things like that, we always apologize to him. Uh, and we hope that he understands what we are telling him. So, um, and we try never to do that kind of thing again. But um, later on, uh, well, ABA has like um, eleven areas, main areas with uh, um, different skills that kids have to learn. And underneath that is a, a total of four hundred and sixty, I think, different skills they have to learn under these eleven main areas. And my son only needs like five or ten of them. I can't remember which they are, and then um, he uh, uh, after kindergarten uh, we trained him in the in the morning, and then from uh, twelve midday and until like four o'clock he was in a normal kindergarten, and that was very good because he was uh, playing with other kids, and um, he was not spending too much time there, and then when he started in school we uh, found a very good private school. And uh, he was there until uh, at the end of, um, no, in the middle of fourth grade. And the reason we took him out was that in the beginning there were um, a state subsidies for a, um, a teacher following him and training him one-to-one. -one. And this teacher was also able to uh, get this ABA training and doing uh, that together with him. That was especially a social training where he would sit with the other kids and, for instance, uh, the teacher would uh, ask him, well, now you have to ask the other kids what they like to eat, what they like to drink, what they like to watch, what they're going to do when the day is over, uh, the school day is over, and then he would um, have to um, 
uh, remember that. And afterwards, the kids, his classmate, would ask him, "Well, what I, what is my favorite eat uh, eating? What is my favorite drink? What is um, what? What's my perf- favorite film? What I'm going to do when I get home?" And in the end, he didn't have to have help for that. He just asked them, and he actually remembered it. That's kind of you know very. Uh, structured, you know, step by step by step by step, increasing his skills, uh, social training. It was uh, very, very good, and 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 that's why the private school setting was very good. But the number of hours per week fell from like eleven to like uh, six, and then we were told that uh, a new reform called inclusion in the Danish public school, which was also going to be uh, enrolled in private schools, that we could expect more hours and. We didn't believe that, but we were hoping. And finally, we heard that he fell from six to five hours per per week. And you know, every week that um, sorry, every hour um, per week that the uh, government took away, we had to uh, substitute ourselves. In the beginning, we paid ourselves, but that got that got way too expensive in the end. So we had to say goodbye to his uh, teacher, and we had to do the uh, one-to-one training ourselves at the private school. So I was. Um, my my wife uh, continued to work full time and i went part time so i could uh, be with him at school but in the end we were doing so many hours at school just uh, him he and i one to one and uh, and uh, we wanted to do those at home and then we would go to school and be with his classmates you know for gymnastics uh, you know when they had to learn to draw i don't know uh, you know all of being creative and uh, for music lessons and stuff like that that was perfect but uh, because he got these five hours of help from the government, uh, the government said that's uh, illegal, and uh, the school would get a big fine if they discovered that we were doing a combination of, you know, homeschooling, being at the private school, and he, uh, him getting some uh, support. So um, we ended up saying that uh, this is not good because we spent way too many hours in a in a room by our own. It was not very motivating, and I. Th- in the end, I thought we were being cruel to him, so we stopped at school and we started doing homeschools, and we've done that since December this year. And now, when I uh, teach him, I try to do it as voluntary as possible. I always give him mom- give him money. Uh, he earns uh, what's approximate it's approximately three dollars U.S. dollars per day, and um, and he. Um, I always get, you know, that during the day he may have a, a glass of uh, juice, we may have some snacks, and uh, he, I may uh, agree with him that part of his salary is not just, uh, uh, I shouldn't call it money. I like, like Ma- Michael Lonely says, I he earns currency. So uh, besides him earning some currency, he um, he gets to, you know, for instance, play uh, on his PlayStation, he may watch a cartoon. So all in all, he and I agrees during the day uh, what will he get for attending uh, his lessons? And um, it's absolutely amazing. I really enjoy it. I'll never ever go back to uh, to, uh, to to him going to school. Uh, at, at least not as long as he is, as young as he is, and he's twelve now. And uh, not as long as he um, he uh, needs um, more training for him to be uh, able to speak better. Later on in life, if he wants to, when he grows uh, and when he is getting older and he's getting an independent grown up, he may choose for himself whether or not he wants to go to any kind of school. Yeah, but I, I think it's uh, it's uh, it's really inter- interesting actually. Um, I wish I had I could have learned those skills when I was young. <laughs> yeah, because I knew absolutely nothing when I got out of school. Okay, I spent like. The first ten years after that, just playing computer. So, yeah. Okay. So that that I really wish I could have yeah. had that kind of experience mm. when I was young and yeah. the incentives and and yeah. just the the allowance for curiosity. I was um, that old saying um, with the the guy who's uh, asking a lot of questions. I don't yeah. know in English, but okay. but I was told that a lot. Mm-hmm. Never ask ask questions. So I stopped asking questions at all. Yeah. That okay. It was really annoying. Mm. Okay. So yeah, it's great to hear. Yeah. Your story actually. And um, uh, I was just thinking that um, yeah, the Danish government says that you have to teach, and I think that's okay. Uh, I, I wouldn't uh, not teach him those things. Uh, we have to teach him, uh, you know. Uh, Danish and um, 
writing and in, in reading. We have to teach him math. And we also have to teach him English. And besides that, you can teach him whatever you like. And um, I think that's very nice that it's not, you know, you have to teach him geography. You have to teach him uh, sewing uh, with a kit. Uh, you have to teach him uh, riding a bike or whatever it could be. Um, these are up to us as parents and uh, evaluate uh, what uh, what does he need to be uh, to, to be taught. Um, and um, we have, uh, in the beginning, we used, of course, school books, uh, ordinary school books with a pencil. Um, and uh, later on, we were able to afford buying an iPad for him. And that has been very, very good because he's very motivated on uh, working on that platform. Um, we have not moved totally away from books. He sometimes reads books, but um, uh, like, you know, doing math exercises and uh, writing exercises, uh, we have um, not used books for quite a while. We will return until late, uh, later on. Just go digitally with the books. Yeah. So. yeah um, what I like to uh, do is not uh, making everything absolutely digital. Um, I like it to be a combination of of um, of, um, of stuff uh, or you know um, uh, uh, equipment or what you could call it uh, uh, that that we are using. I like to to those to be uh, sort of different. And in math right now, I've discovered that he really needs to automate. You know. What is one plus one, one plus two, three plus five, six minus three, seven minus four, from you know zero to zero up to ten uh, plus ten or ten minus ten, and he he uh, masters that now. Uh, he can these uh, like um, they are at the back of his neck, and now we are also uh, rehearsing. Um, uh, multiplication tables and he knows them uh, very well and now we are also automating those there are lots of great games on the, on the iPad where you can learn these things but we also have what's called flashcards where you it's like you know white business cards there are nothing written on the fourth and the back side of it so you write for instance six times seven equals on the one side and when you flip it over you have uh, 42 on the back and this way I can test exactly which he knows and which he does not know. And then I put these on a super um, area on the table if he knows them uh, instantly. I put them on a okay area on the table if he, uh, you know, uh, uh, counts with his finger very visible. Uh, it's okay, uh, but they, it's not perfect. And then if he makes an error, it's on the, uh, in, in a wrong area. And it's so cool, he gets quite a quite competitive. He hates when uh, some of the flash cards ends up in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the wrong section. So, but that's a very good way and, and there are well, ways you can move away, move around with these flash cards and it really trains him uh, in very, very well. So, so, well, competition does give a lot of it. And so yeah, yeah, exactly. I know that from myself. I yeah, okay. want to be better than everyone. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But uh, I've actually stopped doing any other kinds of exercises in his math books because I discovered whenever he had to do any, and they are good exercises in his math books, it took like a thousand years because he did not master the multiplication tables. He only masters plus and minus. And after the multiplication, uh, we are going to uh, train um, division. So that might take the whole next school year mastering those things, but that's okay. It's vital for him, so I'm going to do that. And then, of course, we I write stories for him. Um, it's important that stories are not like a a story about a mice um, telling a story about what he dreamt, and in that dream, uh, something uh, you know uh, metaphysically happened. That's so far away from what he understands. It has to be stuff that actually uh, could appear in the real world. So I, for instance, write a story and uh, it's a short one and I include some images, I put it on our, uh, on our um, uh, homeschool blog and um, then I write like from 7 to 15 questions for him and he has to answer those in order for him to constantly train uh, that he, because he reads perfectly but he has great difficulties understanding what he's read. It's the same as if I gave you, uh, I assume you don't read Italian or understand Italian, but let's say I gave you an Italian newspaper. I bet you could read an article and you could actually pronounce uh, the words in a way that a person from Italy would actually understand what you were uh, uh, reading, but uh, you would not understand anything that you read. 
So it's the same way that he reads the words perfectly, but uh, he has so so many difficulties actually understanding what he's uh, read. So the stories are right for him, needs to be adjusted to his uh, level all the time, but of course constantly pushing and pushing and pushing, so he gets better and better and better. Mm, I can see that. Mm. Yeah, and and one, sure. yeah, and <laughs> and then I met a. Um, uh, I I became a very good friend uh, with a um, a nice lady from the United States uh, via Facebook, and she uh, was very interested that I was uh, homeschooling and that my son had autism, and she was asking uh, uh, what we were doing, and I told her, and then she said that uh, I, she she had a son who was suffering from. Uh, it's abbreviated cap d it's it means central auditory processing disorder i would in in, in uh, layman terms i would call it you're, that you're brain deaf and uh, then i read a lot about cap d mm -hmm. and i could see that the uh, symptoms are very 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 similar to what my son is suffering from this uh, in addition to um for him to be uh, to have autism so uh, and she cured him uh, after going to an expert. Uh, she she cured his um, language problem by teaching him sign language. So I agreed with my wife that we would cut down on the English lessons and we would really speed up on sign language. And it's going very 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 well. He is visible, very strong. You know, like when you test his IQ, uh, and IQ uh, tests are always, um, uh, you know. Um, adjusted for a, a, a child or a grown-up's age yeah. and they have to have an um, uh, what do you call it uh, a, um, an average of 10 points if it's language skills uh, well he has a uh, score like 3 and 4 on average and uh, it's not a surprise but for instance when it's visible skills he sometimes scores 16 because he's so strong visibly um, uh, he can for instance you can uh, you can uh, lay in front of him 12 12 different things you can then put a blanking on top of it and then you can remove two items and you can actually mix those that are left you can remove the blanket and he can tell you which, what two parts are missing that's how visibly strong he is so I actually immediately I, I thought to myself well of course sign language might be a much better way because I'm using signs that are visible it's not just sounds and my mouth moving around so um, we started teaching him that and that's going very well we are always uh, teaching him things that uh, are um, um, combined with images. So we have taught him things from a farm and we have taught him a lot of stuff that you can buy in a supermarket and now we are teaching him stuff that you can uh, that you can um, expect to find in a house and we have some great small conversations now. I can for instance ask him in sign language there might be for instance, twelve items on a on a on a on a on a, on a piece of paper, uh, with, with you know, with images of things that you can buy in a supermarket. And then I ask him, which of these items need to be in the refrigerator? So he had to need to think. Well, uh, bleach, um, soap, uh, that's for cleaning. That should not be in the refrigerator. Um, this should and this and that that should be in a freezer. Okay, the remaining parts needs to go to the fridge. Having that kind of conversation w w was not possible before, you know, when he would actually get a, a quite, it's quite, for him, quite difficult question. So that's absolutely awesome that we can use sign language like that. And another thing uh, we've discovered that uh, re recently has, um, and that didn't take long since we started doing sign language, usually he would uh, like sitting at a family dinner and uh, he would uh, try to eat fast so that he did not have to participate in the conversation because of course that was difficult so he would eat fast and then ask uh, nicely can i leave the table i want to go play and uh, but now he's, he's sitting in, in, in um, uh, and talking to us and he is also at you know family dinner where more, we're not just us but we were uh, it could be my parents or it could be at my wife's parents or, or a, a, a larger gathering of, of family uh, he tells what he's been doing lately and he tells what he's uh, looking forward to and um, that's absolutely awesome. He would he didn't do that in, in the past and I, I cannot say that that's due to sign language but I think it's, it's strange that shortly after we are, we are starting with sign language he actually changes his behavior that, uh, that much uh, during family dinner. It might sound for uh, people, ordinary kids as, well that's no biggie, that's a Biggie, biggie, <laughs> for us. I have to cut you off now. Yeah, okay. We've already talked for too long. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. Almost too long, actually. Yeah. But it's been 
a great conversation. Well, yes. one-sided, but it's been great. Yeah. I enjoyed listening to it. Okay, great. And so, uh, well, uh, yeah, no we have to tell um <laughs> Just a little bit. Um, I, I would like to have you on again sometime yes. to continue the conversation. Yeah, that would be great. We um, have a lot more to talk about. So. Definitely, definitely. Sorry, I thought we were finished recording, so I switched to Danish. I apologize. That's no problem. <laughs> okay. I, I'm sure people would just find it funny. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I hope so. Yes, thank you for the conversation too. I should very much like to come uh, on your show again. I'll be looking forward to it. Okay, thank great. Thank you very much. Yes, bye. Bye.